Hi there, it's Marcus again. Snapshot number five, looking at the week six, six reading, Weird People, congratulating you on completing your first assessment item, letting you know that I will put up a, uh, a recording soon about what's required for the second assessment using the Pecha Kucha method. Uh, I've got the PowerPoint all set up, I've just got to record it. So I've been a busy boy. I'm hoping that you're sort of settling into the course now. I want to talk a little bit for actually half of this um, snapshot is sort of setting the scene and giving some context for the things that we're looking at now in the course. Look, the course, as I keep saying, is an evolutionary course, looking at the way human societies across the planet have evolved, looking at the context in which we can think and rethink, reinvent perhaps, global citizenship, and so on. And of course, you know, because we are working historically, we do have to think about how can we expand our time horizons, okay, into the decades and the centuries to come, which of course is the right across the top of our screen here. It's taken from an image uh, from a talk that was um, given by Roman Karadzic, whose book I have floating around here somewhere, <laughs> I've got so many books floating around. I sort of go to, I lurch for this book or lurch for that book. And I sometimes, like now, can't find it. Uh, Roman is an interesting, is that it? No, that's not it. Uh, interesting Australian philosopher now living in London. His uh, book is on uh, the good ancestor and on how to be a good ancestor. Oh, I know where I left the book. It was it's out on the table in the lounge room. So uh, we've got a short uh, three-minute clip narrated by Roman, which uh, I will be sharing with you this particular snapshot. But, you know, more importantly, he used this image of the bus. Now, I like that. It makes me very happy because we have to ask ourselves, as Vanessa Machado de G. Oliveira has asked, in her book, Hospicing Modernity, currently on loan, I, I have my copies on loan uh, to an honours student, um, she has um, a set of, what would we call them, um, workshop uh, processes that she runs. And one of them is, asked, is she asks, who is on the bus and where are they seated? This question of seating is really important because some people on the bus are more heavily represented, like us in the West, for instance, uh, than others. Um, certainly, yeah, some are totally invisible, though, down the back. Of course, you might have some feral people right down the very back, if you're remembering those, your experiences of sitting on school buses and so on. Maybe you were down the back. Hopefully, uh, you were a bit feral yourself, but maybe you weren't. Uh, certainly, you know, there are people in the middle of the bus but it's not just people we're talking about here. Um, in big history or human, uh, this world history with the human scale that we're looking at, it's, it's actually cosmic. So there are animals, plants, the earth, the physicalities of our environment are on the bus too. And nobody asks the hill whether it wants to give itself over to being quarried for, um, you know, uh, gravel or uh, granite or road base or whatever it might be. Nobody asks trees whether they want to be cut down or koalas, whether they want to, you know, be uh, culled as they were heavily in Queensland in the 1920s or 30s, you know. That, so we don't think to ask certain questions, key questions, which are key particularly to Indigenous worldviews. So this question of who's on the bus needs to be asked because human society, human culture, as we might call it, doesn't exist in a vacuum. And that's what David Christian points out very early on in his, um, in fact, it's the first statement in his, uh, in the course reading for week one. So let's keep moving then. So how do we think intergenerationally? I've got a great image of this that's not in Portuguese, but I also have been studying Portuguese for the last three years because I'm I've done some work in Brazil and I actually really liked it and I thought, well, I'm going to learn Portuguese. But uh, so to be born, para nascer, precisamos de, okay, we need to be, we need to have, you could say, two parents, four grandparents, 
eight great grandparents, 16 great great grandparents. We're going to give up on the great greats and greats, I'll get lose count. Then there are 32, 64. And if we go back 250 years, there were roughly, we, each one of us here, has roughly 200, uh, no, 2048 Deca grandparents. Avos, vos, avos means grandparent in Portuguese. So roughly 250 years ago, we had 2,048 ancestors. That means if we go forward 250 years, we're going to have, given that we reproduce, of course, uh, 2000, uh, we're going to be one of 2,048 people that have collided with some other individual to create a child. That's just the human dimension. To think 2,048 people needed to be living, breathing, uh, hoping, dreaming, working hard, feeling despair or depressed, feeling rage and hope and joy, falling in love, falling out of love, whatever it might be. 2,048 people had to be operational 250 years ago for, um, for us to be here today. To me, that's a mind-boggling thought, and, I, and, it, and it should be mind-boggling to you too. And I spent a lot of time thinking about this and talking about it with people and so on. So to think intergenerationally is one of the invitations that our reading from Henrich gives us, uh, provides for us today. And, you know, it's really important that this course triggers and also supplies you with some skills to do that kind of thinking. So let's keep moving. And I've got, hopefully I've got you all wondering about that family tree that somebody, maybe even you, were creating for your own family. Um, because, I mean, my sisters have been knocking out a family tree for my family, and they haven't got back beyond 16, beyond the great-great-grandparents. Yeah, so it's, um, and even then, I don't think there's records for all of them. Okay, so to go back to 2048 is mind-boggling. So, where are we then? All right, so we're thinking long time. Now, I asked you, hopefully you've gone and done it, to have a listen to that wonderful first episode by Ella Saltmarsh, narrated by Ella Saltmarsh, um, on thinking intergenerationally or thinking long time. In our seminar number one, for week one, I uh, let you uh, listen to or experience the uh, long time uh, practice, that's what they call them, the long time practice um, that they, uh, where they walked us 200 years, and uh, no, 100 years back and 100 years forward. So that's roughly four generations back, four generations forward. Now, what does it mean then if we start thinking this way to be a good ancestor? To be here now in this affluent country, benefiting from, you know, the the horrors and the struggles and the hard work, because it's all of that, of the of the past one to two centuries, is means that we've had some good ancestors. We also probably had some really um, yucky ones as well, There's no doubt, because people are people, and in history in the past, you know, there was violence, there was a whole bunch of cruelties, there was the sort of the closed-mindedness of generations of people who saw other people as less than human or whatever it might be. So we've got the Long Time Academy, uh, bl not blog, um, podcast for you to listen to. And I hope you've had a good listen to that. One of the people that was interviewed for that one was Roman Karajic, uh, Karajic. He's the guy that wrote the book Good Ancestor. Can't recommend it enough. It's a hopeful book uh, because he points out that many of the things that we need to turn the, uh, you know, the, what seems like a doomed ship of modernity around uh, are being practised today. So his book is all about that. He talks about donut economics. He talks about different forms of polity and democracy. He talks about communities and cooperatives. Um, and he gives us two beautiful metaphors, which I'll share with you. So you can see, if you look at the good ancestor here, you can see that there's an acorn there. He talks about acorn thinking and marshmallow thinking. So I'll start with marshmallows because you probably prefer them to acorns. Um, some of you may never have seen an acorn for that matter. 
uh, because we're, it's a little bit too warm for oak trees up here. Neighbours tried to grow with one, but they're not. It, that, it, it always looks sickly, poor old tree. But anyway, so the the marshmallow though is something that you're all familiar with. Um, Roman gives us the marshmallow to think about because uh, there are plenty of tests done on, let's say, chimpanzees and, and high-level mammals uh, where you put one marshmallow down in front of them um, and, of course, it goes straight away. They do this with human children as well, age six, seven years of age. They put a marshmallow in and say, look, if you can leave that marshmallow for 15 minutes, we'll give you 10 or something like that. I'm not sure what the number is. Um, nearly always, he observes, that the child will have the marshmallow now rather than waiting, just like the high-level uh, primate. So this is short-term thinking. This is, oh, I want that marshmallow now. I can't wait 15 minutes. One of the th things that, um, what's his name, Henrik, and I'm just going to grab his book here, points out in his book, Weird, is that uh, in the West, we've been taught, we've been trained to be patient. We've been trained and disciplined, you might say, or even domesticated, to, to play off one of the previous themes of this, one of these snapshots, uh, to wait, to be patient. We're patient. You are suffering through my history course because you want to go out there and be a history teacher um, because you want to be able to uh, have a family, uh, own your own home and car and everything, just like your mum and your grandparents did or whatever. All right? That sort of thing. It's called deferred gratification. The acorn thinking, though, is slightly different. It's not about deferred gratification or instant gratification. It's actually saying, okay, an, oak, an acorn uh, will, uh, you know, if it's in the right situation, the right setting, will grow and be well over a thousand years before old, oh, before it dies. It will grow into a tree. He uses the metaphor of the acorn to represent intergenerational long-term thinking. And he, and he develops his book around the, the I guess, the dance between short-termism and long-term. Um, it's a really good book. I recommend it to you as well. Uh, you can tell that I've had to be very disciplined with uh, my use of readings for this course. There are so many good readings out there. There are so many ways that we could do this course. We could, we could do a good old thumping history course where and right now in week six, uh, we would be, I think, week six or week seven, we were around about the Renaissance and, and so on, and we'd be comparing the Chinese and the Indian, the Islamic civilizations with the Western civilization and so on. But that's not the way we're doing this course. We're, this course is about, okay, so what are the drivers and, and how, are the, how are people using history, global thinking in world history, to think about the human condition, where we're going, and who we're going with. So my question of who's on the bus is very, very important. It's not my question. Actually, I stole it off um, Machado de, de G. Oliveira, didn't I? So anyway, uh, let's keep moving again. So what do we have here? We have the, what I promised you, um, which is a, um, a lovely, short, three-minute video. Uh, skip verification. Here we're going to skip the verification. We've jumped out of this. We're jumping into... Here we go, the good ancestor, and I have to click play, don't I? Nice introduction, by the way. I'll let you enjoy it. Three minutes. We Homo sapiens are newcomers in the cosmic story. If the age of the Earth is the distance from your nose to the tip of your outstretched hand, one stroke of a nail file erases human history. But just as there's deep time behind us, there's deep time ahead. In six billion years, any creatures that will be around to see our sun die will be as different from us as we are from the first single-cell bacteria. Yeah, in an eye blink of just two centuries, done untold damage to the living world. Hooked on short-term thinking, we urgently need a sense of a longer now. There's so how bus. can we expand our time horizons into the decades and centuries to come? By 
realizing that we are all part of a great chain of life, stretching far into the past and long into the future. But we've been shining the light only on the present moment. We must now cast it far more widely, so that we recognize the legacy we will leave for the generations to come. Just as we have received gifts from our ancestors, those who planted the first seeds, founded the cities we live in, and made the scientific discoveries that have ensured our survival, so we too can pass on gifts to posterity. Imagine a child you know and care about, growing older, then holding their own grandchild in their arms. This newborn could live long into the 22nd century. Their future isn't science fiction, it's an intimate family fact. What kind of world do we want to leave to future generations? And how will they judge us for what we did, or didn't do, when we had the chance? We stand at a pivot point in history. We can turn our backs on the future, or choose to become good ancestors. this week pull back up to this here we are so the question then we need to ask is the question that Joe Henrik asks repeatedly throughout his long book very well researched book is who am I or I might suppose it who are you how would you define yourself this is a question about how we locate ourselves in the world it's a philosophical it's a metaphysical question but it's also a very practical question you might say, I'm the son of such and such, or I'm the brother or sister of, or I'm the parent of, and so on. You might say, that, you know, an understanding that you exist within multiple circles of being and definition that you are an Australian or a Queenslander or wherever you come from. You might also say that you are a student, a student of history or a student of X. Um, and that, and that being that student, you are hoping to be a teacher or a journalist or a short story or a novelist, a short story writer, finish my sentences, or whatever it might be. Um, you know, so we can keep on going. The question for this course ultimately is, what does it mean to you to be a global citizen? This is why I keep giving you these conversations. The, the fascinating conversation for week six is the one I had with Jacques Barcia. Uh, a wonderfully creative Brazilian thinker, short story writer, a futurist, and, and many other things. He and I collaborated some years ago, as I say in our interview, um, and I was asking about solar punk. Oh, and I happen to have one of my solar punk books right next to me. I love solar punk. I'm a bit of a nerd for this sort of thing. So there you go. Multi-species cities, solar punk urban futures. It's the sort of thing that really matters, and it matters this course because more, more and more of us are going to be living in cities, urban lives, into the future. Urbanisation is one of the themes, major themes of the second half of this course. So, we need to ask ourselves, how do we locate ourselves in the world? For Henrik, how we answer is determined by our culture. For him, uh, we in the West, all of us listening to this and taking this course, for instance, are weird. Or are we not, perhaps? You might say, no, I don't want to be weird. Um, but if you look at what he means by weird, you know, wealthy, educated, industrialised, um, rich, no, not rich, what does it R stand for? And D is democratic, isn't it? Um, you know, are we these things? Okay, or are we some of these things? You're, you're being educated. Uh, you might say, no, <laughs> we've been as poor as church mice all our lives. Um but, you know, that's not what he means by wealthy. He means comparatively wealthy. Now, we live in Australia, one of the wealthiest per capita nations on the planet. Now, we benefit from multiple violences in the past, violences in the present, and no doubt, violences into the future. That's a bit depressing, isn't it? But, you know, it's still a wonderful country. 
why? How can I say such a, a thing when so much flies in the face? Well, it's a wonderful country because the world is beautiful. And that brings me to Robin Wall Kimmerer. We've got this beautiful podcast. It's up in the extra readings, um, I think. Or did I whack it into the modules? I think I actually put it into the modules. She wrote this glorious book, Braiding Sweetgrass. And she's also written a book on mosses. Um, she speaks beautifully. Um, she's an indigenous um, original American by background, the Potawatomi people, uh, though she grew up not speaking a word of her own culture or her own people's because, like, we had our stolen generation, well, the Americans had theirs as well. So have a listen to that, because for Kimmerer, she, uh, she's thinking in terms of relationships. Now, I come to relationships via this big fat book from, uh, on weird people, uh, from Henrik, uh, as well, because he's pointing out that one of the things about, you know, being rational in our modern world is that it, we tend to see the trees but not the forest. We don't see the bigger patterns, the more relational patterns that uh, modern science has forgotten. Okay. I also uh, point, and I'm going to quote one extract from Mina Salami. She's in the extra readings uh, on being black. She she argues very strongly from a feminist, but not a not a she from an African feminist. Uh, that's the way to put it. From an African feminist perspective, that we are historical beings that uh, black is a form of defiance. To be black, to say I am black or I'm Indigenous or I'm Australian, uh, Aboriginal, Australian or what, First Australian or First Nations, whatever it is, these are all forms of resistance, that we are defining ourselves. Who am I? Well, a key element in my, she, she's, this is quoting her now, in my becoming consciously black was clearly to resist the Europatriarchal definitions that claimed otherwise. Okay, because she had uh, um, one parent was black from Nigeria, the other parent was Swedish. Or was it Finnish? I forget now. That blackness was powerless, uh, shameful, ugly, unintelligent. These are all labels that, uh, in particularly powerfully racist communities, and I ended with Tulsa riots last week, didn't I? Um, you know that you know there are certain ways of seeing the world in which some people are less than others. This is a Europatriarchal vision, okay? Not only are women and children less than men, white women and children, that is, but, you know, we have a, a hierarchy, you could say, and she's speaking to that, she's challenging that. In other words, rather than the rich legacies of African heritage people, and she doesn't want to say African people or just black people, she's using black as a term of, of liberatory power. Blackness came with an inherent protest a need to object to the erroneous definitions of blackness and to defiantly assert positive, empowering ones. Okay, so positive, empowering definitions from being black rather than definitions associated with the slave trade, the image behind this uh, quote here, um, the violences that we in Australia perpetrated against the First Nations people here, and so on. So it's a complicated thing. You, being a global citizen for... Salami is not the same as it is for you or me. We all have our struggles. Some of them will be emotional uh, identity struggles. Others will be quite clearly the fact that maybe you're in, you know, in a dysfunctional relationship and being a woman that you know, you're know you bullied and harassed or you seek to please too much. These are kind of learned behaviours. However, wherever you sit just listen to the voices of some of the people that i'm sharing with you through this course don't forget that many of those voices are in the past but you know it's i personally I, i've always accepted that there are voices in the future too that not just my grandchildren but grandchildren in general great grandchildren as karajnik points out uh will they what will they say about us will they think that we were absolutely mad? Will they be angry at us and curse us? Uh, or will they celebrate the fact that we actually managed to start the, the work of changing the civilizational juggernaut that we're all part of and moving it into healthier, more relational spaces? Who knows, okay? 
So, a, a bald slide for a change. You must go, oh, thank God, a bald slide. Identity and world history, then. One of the key questions that we ask, world historians ask, is how did the West end up dominating the planet? That's a question that um, good old uh, Henrik asked in this book, but also I've got another book of his over here, The Secrets of Our Success, where he talks more broadly about the role that culture plays in creating the conditions out of which European ascendancy emerged. This weird book, though, is more focused on the socio-psychology of the West. So this is where this week's reading comes in, right? The West is made up of weird people, in brackets, like us. To demonstrate this, he draws together a range of historical, anthropological, and psychological material. Okay, I want to emphasize that this is interdisciplinary work. No longer can you be an historian or an anthropologist or a psychologist without... Um, engaging with, working with other disciplines for a fuller picture of what it means to be human. Of course, I say no longer, but in actual fact, there are many historians, many anthropologists and many psychologists out there, as well as other people who work as though there's nobody else in their world other than psychologists, anthropologists or historians. So, you know, this is part of the new thinking. And of course, it's relational work. I, I think that's one of the steps in towards a um, what would we call it a world uh, of greater harmony uh, and greater balance and greater tolerance for difference and so on is the interdisciplinary because from an academic perspective the interdisciplinary is a uh, is a protest against disciplinary boundaries and it is also a relational uh, action in itself so let's start off looking at our reading then See, I told you half of this talk would be about <laughs> about setting up the context. But context is extraordinarily important. So when I read this, I thought, I've read something very much like that before. Um, it's someone like Raywin Connell, one of the great Australian sociologists, wrote a paper decades and decades ago, it shows how old I am, uh, where uh, she, uh, or if it wasn't her, somebody else, uh, posits the fact that if anthropologists from Mars or some outer space place came to the Earth, what would they see? It was an excellent paper and it really created waves at the time. I went searching for it, but I couldn't find it. I'm going to have to ask uh, one of my sociologist friends if they know. Makes very much the same point, though. If we went back a thousand years, so if a team of alien anthropologists had surveyed uh, our planet's a thousand years ago in 1000 C or even 800 years ago 1200 C they would never have guessed that the Europeans living in that sort of very um, congested disease ridden backward fearful neurotic paranoid place called Europe would have dominated this globe in the second half of the millennium instead they would probably put their bet on China or the Islamic world interestingly enough leaving out the alien anthropologist bit, this is exactly what people like David Christian and others uh, are saying in the more traditional big history narrative that uh, this course sort of sits around. So, pro-sociality and the market integration. Now, I've been wanting to use an image of, it's a bit blurry, but uh, an image of uh, Mont Saint-Michel, the fab fabulous cathedral church off the coast of France, I think in Brittany, for a long time. And I did it because one of the things, one of the preconditions for our weirdness is Christianity. And, you know, uh, Henrix goes to quite, you know, long lengths, you might say, to demonstrate this. In fact, the second half or the last quarter or whatever it is of that chapter that I asked you to read is where he's looking at the role of the church in the urbanisation and uh, the political, psychological, or socio-psychological shifts that occurred in Europe or needed to occur for weirdness to emerge. So, pro-sociality means to be positively social, but not in the way that um, pre-modern societies were. We're not our sociality is not built around family or clan or uh, some form of tribal allegiance. It's built around a uh, almost the absence of these things. It's an abstract condition that allows for what he calls market integration. Interesting thing, as a sort of a side note, I would say about Joseph Henricks is that he is both an anthropologist as well as a psychologist. Uh, oh, and he was, he's also a, 
he's a professor at Harvard and his professorship sits in psychology and economics, interestingly enough. So this is where his market integration work comes in is through his economics lens. This process simplifies relationships to the functional. I will get a plumber in, he's not going to be a person, I may never have met this plumber before to come and fix something, I will get an electrician in, I will get down the shop and I will buy some potatoes that have been grown by some anonymous person, possibly hundreds of kilometres away. Pro-sociality is also learnt, it's wired into our brains. Um, and the brain, in the, particularly in the first five years of our life, but even you know over the first 20 years of our life, is a, um, is, has a plasticity about it. It, uh, it ends up firing or chiseling into the, those neurons ways of seeing and understanding the world that make it intelligible and meaningful and that help us survive in the world. So we've learned to be pro-social, to trust anonymous people we've never met to do something. One of the market, the market economy is very important in that, of course, the use of money particularly. So he offers us the studies of Oromo, and the Mapuche, okay, and uh, the next slide actually gives some st uh, some of the uh, figures from that chapter that you read. He talks about silent trade. That means the uh, this is a silent trade occurred before pro sociality and the market integration occurred. He gives us the example of the Carthaginians leaving goods on the beach, people coming down and leaving some gold, taking the goods. And, and so on. I like that. And Cretan's goods is also interesting. That's where, oh, I know that my father has always bought boots from this particular cobbler family. I'm going to go down and I'm going to buy boots from that family too. Why? Because my father thought they were good and I will continue to think they're good. You, so there's credibility attributed to certain goods. But it's not, comes through, it doesn't come through this pro-sociality or the market integration. He talks about the historical origins of pro-sociality through the Western Church, and he talks about the role of urbanisation. So we're going to come to those a little bit more. Now let's keep moving. So here we've got um, two of the uh, little figures that um, Henrik gives us. One on the left, uh, figure 9.3, is looking at the relationship of or the level of pro-sociality in groups of the Roma people depending on how close or far they were to urban centres. Urban centres raises pro-sociality that means the anonymity dimension in terms of social trust and so on. Whereas the figure on the right is about the uh, the impact that churches have had on urban communities where he demonstrates that the longer that a church has been, or church, uh, churches, cathedrals, monasteries have been associated with the urban, the more likely those urban centres are to adopt uh, forms of representative government and also forms of uh, market integration. Now this is very, very interesting. It shows you how we can use historical context ask different questions of it to, to uh, come up with different forms of information. Information is um, data that has value, that helps us understand or achieve or argue for certain perspectives. I think it's very, very important and it's really interesting to me that over the last decade or so, there are many books like these, this book on the weird people coming out to explain all forms of um, human activity from different perspectives. In other words, people are using the disciplines like history, scholars, academics, social activists and so on, uh, are using um, forms of information and data access to challenge the dominant narratives of our day, the, what we would call the hegemonic narratives of our day. So here's Florence around about 1400, okay. Um, the longer a city was exposed to the church, the faster it grew, and the more likely it was to develop a participatory governance. That's really interesting. Florence, in, our, in the very beginning of the 12th century, uh, revolted against, um, you know, a form of authoritarian rule and became, declared itself a republic. 
being a republic wasn't easy because they people had to learn how to negotiate well negotiation back in the 12th century in florence often meant killing one another stabbing one another bludgeoning one another fighting in the streets and so on uh, the great poet dante alighieri was expelled from florence and was never able to return um, because of such uh, strife so we but we do have a city like florence now what do we see right in the middle of this image well we can see a big church if you've ever been to florence you'll know that there's a stunning cathedral there as there are across all medieval cities in in italy and in europe um, and that these stunning cathedrals all go back to roughly the same sort of period that period of gothic cathedral building period between let's say 1000 ce through to 1350 CE or something like that uh, so you know there is a very interesting connection between the presence of established wealthy churches in cities and the emergence of new forms of governance and new forms of economics I want to stay with Florence for a little bit so we've got two uh, heroes of that Florence there's Lorenzo Medici is on my right, your right as well, I guess, looking at the thing. And on the other side, the guy holding the uh, golden circular uh, medal is Pico de la Mirandola. Mirandola. I got tripping over that one. Who was a bit of a lad, but one of the greatest uh, minds and philosophers of his day. Died in his mid to late 30s. I think he was uh, murdered, actually. Lorenzo lived longer. He was one of the Medici banking family people. Uh, they were the guys that sponsored people like uh, Leonardo da Vinci, Michelangelo, Raphael, and so on. Had amazing uh, impact on first Italian, Florentine, then Italian, and, and then uh, European politics over a number of centuries. Very, very influential family. All right? So what can we say? Well, in Florence... As a result of new forms of governance, new forms of political agitation and awareness, we had increasing competition. We had the emergence of a humanistic philosophy, humanism, philosophy, education. We, we see that even though the church is there, that its power is being constrained, you could say. Uh, no, no longer is Latin the lingua franca, you could say, of uh, the period. That's a Latin phrase, meaning the, the dominant language or the language spoken by the elites. Vernacular becomes important. Dante and Boccaccio uh, writing in the Florentine vernacular essentially created the modern Italian language because their writing was so influential that it went on to shape the Italian spoken in other parts of Italy. We have, you know, in, you know a, a very strong increase in individualism. It's patriarchal mostly. Um... You could say that women or gender didn't have a renaissance in the same way that men did, or elite men, but there were some elite women who benefited from this as well. Um, we can see the nascent democracy embedded in the Florentine republicanism, but it's very much a, um, a because of competition, a very much, as I said, a violent form of republicanism. Uh, and we can see the, rising, uh, the rise of the secular, which ultimately post uh, the Reformation led to the Enlightenment and this divide between matters of faith and spirit and, and spirituality and matters of reason and which was always associated with the mind, observation, uh, the sciences as they are commonly understood at least. So Florence was really important. Have a quick look again at that beautiful image. Okay, so there's Florence. Here are two f remarkable Florentines. But let's jump to uh, another, we'll notice they're all guys, but, you know, to another fellow. This one's René Descartes. Descartes was uh, writing in the 17th century. Uh, he was very interested in the matters of the spirit, but sought to approach the spirit through reason. He was also an absolutely great example of an early weird person. I have to say that both of these guys were all great examples of weirdness as well. Wealthy, educated, and so on. Not industrialised necessarily, but that the industrialisation is one of the more new, um, one of the uh, more recent additions to our weirdness. But you know, one of the things about individualism is that we tend to enjoy, uh, well, we privilege our own identities over others. So this is some stuff I found in a really interesting paper. The uh, links to which are below this, 
uh, slide in the PowerPoint uh, where Descartes writing to a friend and he says look he's moved to Amsterdam and he says in what other land in, in Holland Netherlands uh, can I enjoy freedom so entire and he, and he explains why in this great city of Amsterdam where everyone but me is engaged in commerce each is so concerned for his own profit that I could stay here all my life without ever even being noticed he loves that I walk every day among the confusion of the crowds with as much freedom and repose as you would have in a park. And I pay no attention, and this is really clinches it for me, no attention to the people I could see here in this, as I would to the trees and animals I might encounter in a forest. So his world is extraordinarily cerebral, mind. Why do, did I pick Descartes? Well, one, hopefully, some of you have heard of him, but many of you may not have heard of him. He's the guy who's, who wrote that famous line, I think, therefore I am, cogito ergo sum. And it was a way of coming, and it was a very big question of faith for him, that how do we know that God exists? And it begins with the fact that we think we have an inner world in here. But, you know, he has no, he has no interest in animals or trees in the forest which I think is also very interesting and very telling of his orientation. He was seeking to divide the world, and he's been critiqued by, uh, for this a lot over the last, I guess, 50 years particularly, for separating matters of reason with matters of emotion, matters of uh, the inner world with matters of the outer world, matters of uh, the mental disciplines of history or whatever it might be, with matters um, of being human, of the human condition. Um, he felt he really struggled to separate these two out. One would have to say he was probably a bit autistic in that regard. And of course, if you read this, you can say, oh, I relate to that. I'm, I'm, I recognize in my own self that I have a kind of autistic uh, leaning, Asperger's type of leaning. Um, I very much love being on my own in my own world. Um, and, you know, the, my few relationships of, of, of depth are, are, are built around that same agreement. There's a silent agreement between my wife and my son and I. We were like that. And I can see in Descartes some of those, uh, some of my myself, I guess, I have to say. You know, there's a hyper-weirdness, but it's called individualism, all right? And for Descartes, as for many of those early ones, uh, Pico de la Mirandola, uh, that I, I mentioned, uh, Lorenzo de Medici, they were all hyper-individualists. And they came from, it was in Italy that, you know, the first artists and musicians started signing their names to things. Putting your name onto a piece of work meant that you were no longer an artisan, anonymous and invisible. But, oh, that painting or that whatever is was created by such and such. Oh, we know him. You know, Michelangelo, Leonardo da Vinci, whoever it might be. Names that even today in our popular world, in our popular culture, still resonate and have this kind of mystique, don't they? So, what does it mean to be weird? It is rich. So, Western? Oh, it's not wealthy, it's Western. There's rich. Because I wanted to say, okay, Western, we are from the West, culturally from the West. It doesn't, you know, you can be, you know, born in China or India or South America. It doesn't matter where, Africa. Um, but, you know, culturally, we are Western, we are educated, we are industrialised, we are rich and we are democratic. That's what, according to our good friend Joseph Henrik, uh, constitutes that, those dimensions, no, it's not singular, it's those dimensions all coming together that tipped the Western world, that was Europe at first, uh, then, then the Anglo-European world, the Spanish-Portuguese world of, uh, as they colonised uh, Central and South America, the Western world of North America, Canada and so on, that all, uh, Australia of course, um, New Zealand, and spread out across the world, that this Western way of doing things was you know, instrumentalised through education, or in, in, what's the word, um, we were conditioned to be Western through education, to be patient, to value competition, and so on. We have an industrialised world that sees the world as uh, the outside world and other human beings as resources. We are rich, so we are uh, immune from the worst of the world that we've created. And we, ha we are economically free. In other words, we are democratic. That means that we have democracies that facilitate 
the uh, rape of the planet uh, and of its peoples and of its, all that's living on the planet for the benefit of Western, educated, rich and industrialised people. How does that sound? That's a pretty sort of um, forceful statement. So, separate is best, it seems, to Descartes in his forest here. But what does Henrik point out? Remember, he's a psychologist, he's an anthropologist, and he's an economist. We often miss, he says, the relationships between the parts. And that's where Kimmerer, uh, Will Kimmerer comes in and people like that. That's where yeah, the salt marsh is coming from. That's where um, Roman Karadzic, Karadzic, should I say? God, I've got to get that name right. Uh, come in with his, you know, good ancestors. That you can't be a good ancestor if you, can't, if you don't think relationally, okay? We often miss the relationships between the parts of, or the similarities between phenomena that don't fit nicely into our categories. Category blindness, in other words, you don't see the wood for the trees, as they say. That is, we know a lot about individual trees, but we've often missed the forest. But he concludes with the following. He concludes a chapter that I asked you to read, chapter 9, the breakdown of intensive kin-based institutions, that was the church working as a solvent there, opened the door to urbanisation and the formation of free cities, and chartered towns, which began developing self-governance, greater self-governance. Often dominated by merchants, urban growth generated rising levels of market integration and, we can infer, high levels of impersonal trust, fairness and cooperation. So, are we weird? Are you weird? This, I chose this, it's, it's an image from Amsterdam. It's a lovely city. I've been there quite a number of times. And, you know, with a friend who lives in one of these high-rise sorts of houses on the left, um, yeah, a fantastic place, uh, but, you know, it's very much the heartland of the weird world. Australia is a um, descendant, you could say, of the world created by the merchants of Europe in the 16th and 17th centuries in particular. So we're going to end there. Thank you very much.